Welcome to Civic Buzz, a program of the League of Women Voters Minneapolis. I'll be moderating our presentation tonight. The League is a nonpartisan critical organization that encourages informed and ac active participation in, in all levels of government, works to increase understanding of major policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. I'm thrilled to be helping the League with this critical work and encourage you, if you're not already a member, to join us. You can find out more at lwvmpls.org. This fall, in addition to choosing their mayor and city council members, voters in Minneapolis will have the opportunity to shape our city's future with their votes on three ballot questions that propose changes to the city charter. In the coming weeks, we'll have a Civic Buzz presentation on each of these questions. Tonight, we're focusing on ballot question two, the proposed public safety amendment. Next Thursday, September 30th, we will hear from experts about ballot question one, the proposed government structure, executive mayor, legislative council amendment. Finally, on Tuesday, October 5th, we'll hear from experts on both sides of ballot question three, the proposed rent control agreement. We hope you'll join us for all three of these informative events. Tonight, I'm honored to present Jane Lansing and Jennifer Wilson, co-chairs of our Reimagining Public Safety Committee. Jane has lived in Minneapolis for 35 years with a four year hiatus when she lived overseas as part of her long career in technology and marketing. She serves on the University of Minnesota's College of Science and Engineering Dean's Advisory Board. Jennifer Wilson is an attorney and longtime resident of Minneapolis and led the league study on the topic. Jane and Jennifer have about a 20 minute presentation, which will cover how the league arrives at its positions, the reimagining public safety committee and study, and the league's new positions on public safety. With that background, they will carefully examine the public safety amendment and discuss how it, it aligns or does not align with the league's positions. We hope that this expert look at the complexities of this amendment will be helpful to you as you are determining how you will vote on ballot question two. Please put your questions in the Q&A section of this webinar, not in the chat. Thank you in advance to Deborah Sugarman, the League's Director of Communications, who will be helping organize the questions. Jane and Jennifer, take it away. I want to thank Ellen for that introduction. And then just again state that the League is a 100-year-old nonpartisan organization. And that means that the League does not support or endorse parties or candidates. However, the League does support um, positions and candidates. Just one other moment here. Um, the League does support positions and has a rigorous process for identifying issues that are critical to our citizens. We study these issues, um, we develop positions, and then we work with an alignment process with most of our with our League members. And hopefully, the League audience out there participated in that alignment process in developing the positions for public safety. So after the murder of George Floyd in the spring of 2020, the Minneapolis League leadership identified public safety as one of those critical issues and formed the Reimagining Public Safety Committee. This became a nine month long study by a dozen League members um, who developed some expertise in the topic. And our approach, um, as it stated here, was to develop, was to review existing public positions research, database best practices on violence prevention, police reform, both locally and nationally, and to review and summarize all of this information so that you could very easily see all the sides of this really complex issue and put that up on our study on our website. Now, you probably joined this civic buzz to learn the League's position on the public safety amendment. The League has not taken a yes, no position on this amendment. Consistent with the League's mission, our goal is to educate voters so you can make the right decision for yourselves and vote.
So the concerns with public safety and police interactions with people of color and the violence um, in policing did not start with the murder of George Floyd. These are just a few of the studies that our committee looked at. In 2015, the ACLU did an excellent data-driven study looking at low level and youth arrests in Minneapolis and the disparity of those across our city. The MPD 150 report documents 150 years of police violence and, and um, discrimination and used interviews with hundreds of community members to paint a picture of those issues. The state of Minnesota in 2019 convened a working group to study police involved deadly force encounters and um, this year, or in 2020 rather, the um, University of Minnesota Center for Urban and Regional Affairs took a look specifically at North Minneapolis. Now, in addition to consistently documenting police mistreatment of people of color, all of these reports came up with similar recommendations and needs. First, to increase transparency and accountability of police use of force um, and improve police training, all of which are needed to create trust with the community. Second, to expand the resources to address public safety. And third, to strengthen communities to stop the formation of criminal behavior. Now, where these reports diverted and diverged is how to do this, reform or abolish and start over. Now, links to all these studies and more are in the resources section on our website. Now, research points to the fact that police are not trained or prepared to respond to the myriad of problems that end up in their labs. Minneapolis receives over 1,911 calls a day. Now, the fire and medical emergencies are pretty easily dispatched to experts in those fields, but everything else is generally routed to the police. This bar chart is from a study that was done in Ohio several years ago, but it's really representative of the issue. It shows the types of calls that police respond to by frequency. Now you might ask, where is shots fired or assault or murder or rape? They were there, but not just not with the frequency of vehicle problems, domestic, medical assistance, general complaints, theft, and increasingly things like homelessness, uh, drug overdoses, erratic behavior, and other societal problems. <clears throat> But the focus of police training has been law enforcement through the use of force for those dangerous situations. And the same study looked at training and estimated that 65% of police training is in law enforcement and the use of force and less than 10% is in social work, mediation, and medical assistance. So there's a mismatch. And yet the need for relying on weapons also escalates with the number of weapons on the street. So it's really a pretty complicated picture. I'm gonna let Jennifer talk about another complexity. Thanks, Jane. I'm going to talk for just a minute about um, some entities and organizations that impact the police department. Um, uh, one, one of the important takeaways from our study is that uh, not only the city and certainly not only the mayor's office have impacts um, and influences on public safety. The slide that we are showing right now is from our website pages, and we're particularly proud of this uh, part of the web page. We're, pr we're proud of all of them, um, but this is an interactive um, piece that if you're on the page, you can, you can click on any one of these circles that show the different um, entities and organizations and learn more about them. So there's a wealth of information there. Uh, but there's, there's a multitude, multitude of entities and organizations with pieces of control uh, uh, over the police, um, each with their own dynamics and programs that may or may not be coordinated at any time with the others. Within the city itself, we have the mayor and city council control. The mayor under the current charter has primary administrative control over the police. The city council has budgetary control. Uh, the mayor proposes the budget, but the city has, council has to approve it. And uh, the 2020 changes to the mayor's budget uh, that from the city council removed $8 million from the MPD with, um, and that was from a 
budget that was already reduced from the prior year. Um, and that helped shift funds to and responsibility to the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, so speaking of that office, that is another part of city government that has a lot of impact on the police and works closely with the police. It used the the, some of the programs that the organization oversees were previously with the police department. Um, but its major effort is to reduce violence by addressing underlying social inequities um, and trying to prevent violence before it starts. Um, then there's in the city, there's also, also the Minneapolis Civil Rights Department, which handles police conduct oversight. Then there are, are other parts inextricably linked to the city, but largely outside of city control. For example, the charter, which is the city's constitution, so to speak. The police federation, which is the union that all the police officers are a part of, and they are the signatory to the police contract, um, along with the mayor and city council members. And the contract between the city and the police federation uh, has a, a great deal of um, influence over the, run, the way the department is run and um, different sort of relief that officers can, can receive. And those particular pieces, the charter, the federation and the contract are connected to state government. Uh, and in, 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 diff in varying ways, the uh, federation has a very strong lobbying presence at the state legislature. Um, and the legislature controls labor li relations statutes, for example, um, arbitration of, of disciplines that get handed down um, within labor unions. Uh, also connected to the state is the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, which handles police licensing. Um, and they're connected to the post board, which is the Minnesota Office Peace Officer Training Board that establishes the licensing and training requirements. Uh, and one quick note about the post board, there's, there's always room there for citizen input. So if you, if, you're, if you like these issues and you're interested, um, check out the post board. They've got a great web page and figure out how you can, you can be involved. Um, and then also besides the, the city and uh, exterior groups and state groups, we've got the county government, which funds and coordinates social services for all of Hennepin County. And they've worked closely with the police department in the past. Uh, and then we have the federal government, which has its own legislative powers, obviously. Uh, but one of the largest impacts that the federal government has on policing is federal qualified immunity, which gives um, public em employees immunity from lawsuits unless that employee has violated a clearly established constitutional or statutory right, um, which is a, a hard bar to meet when it comes to uh, officer complaints and uh, and often gets in the way of any lawsuits against officers as individuals. Okay, so we talked about the background and the major findings of our study. Um, so first, the history of violence and discriminatory practices. We're calling on the police for more than they're trained to deal with. And Jennifer just went through the fact that we need to look well beyond the MPD to truly understand the public safety landscape. So how do we address it? Well, there is no dispute that a public health approach to safety is the way to go. Um, and the city has recognized this, and there are many programs and pilots underway. And I just want to summarize a few of them. In, in 2018, the city established the Office of Violence Prevention that Jennifer just spoke about, and they work with community organizations to prevent and stem violence before it takes hold. You know, Tony Boza, a former MPD chief, once said, by the time the cop appears, the criminal has been formed and the crime has been committed. And the Office of Violence Prevention is working to stop the formation of that criminal. Um, Hennepin County and MPD partners started partnering in 2017 on a co-responder mental health program and had really started to gain some good success and then COVID interrupted that. And there are four 911 pilots underway right now. Three are mental health pilots where the city is trying different models. 
of assessing and responding, and a fourth is a dispatch model for theft and property damage. So they're specifically going after that mismatched that we spoke about earlier and working not to deploy police with guns for every problem that, um, that the citizenry calls on, on them for. So now when there's talk about co-responders and social services, typically what people, um, the, the complaint people raise is, wait a second, you can't send a social service person out on a domestic. Those things are dangerous. Well, I really encourage you to watch the January 5th civic buzz on this topic. We have professionals in this city who deeply understand this problem and are working and collaborating together. And I tell you, it really made me confident to know that we have expertise like this working, working on this. So it's a, it's a really terrific uh, um, webinar. <clears throat> now, in addition to broadening the response, there have also been several reforms put in place to deal with the history of violent and discriminatory practices, um, behavioral changes like um, banning chokeholds, eliminating minor traffic stops, prohibiting, prohibiting officers from reviewing or disabling body cameras, banning no-knock raids. But critics will say you can't rule change your way out of culture problems. Um, so to try to address this, um, the city has also made some changes. And they changed the recruiting focus to try to attract people with social services experience and Minneapolis residency, banned um, the warrior style training. And in July, just started rolling out the active bystander training for all officers. And what I just ran through are just some examples of the tremendous number of changes that have taken place, a lot of them in the last year. You know, our city, like the world, was shaken. Um, when George Floyd was killed by a police officer and our leaders moved quickly and our team was really impressed by all the work as we researched and we end up actually creating a whole section in our study called efforts to reimagine. But you know, this is just the beginning. Um, we have a hundred year old problem that's going to take years, if not decades to solve. And um, there, these changes are not enough. Additionally, we need to go beyond what is what we can achieve in the city as Jennifer went through that really complex map and look at things beyond that. So the city, state and federal leaders need to go after these institutional barriers that have slowed change over decades. The first one, as Jennifer mentioned, that federation contract. You know, one of the reasons we don't have um, transparency to the use of force by bad cops is the contract. Um, that contract also allows cops 48 hours before being questioned in a use of force incident. Now, certainly citizens don't get um, 48 hours to develop a testimony. Um, the second one, state mandated arbitration. A, na a, a national study shows that 52% of disciplinary actions by chiefs are reduced or overturned by arbitration. You have to ask yourself, how can a leader change the culture if he or she cannot enforce disciplinary actions. Now I have to point out that Minnesota actually is better than the national average on this and Minnesota has made some changes to the arbitration process and is cited in literature as a leading example, but there are still, still work needed in this area. And lastly, federal qualified immunity. It's designed to protect public employees um, for their actions on the job, which seems like a reasonable protection on the surface, but critics like the American Bar Association will argue that it has been unreasonably applied in the case of police officers. When over half of the police officers who've been accused of violating someone's rights, and usually for some form of excessive force, um, have been granted immunity, and there's good reading on this. So I'm going to turn it back to Jennifer, and she's going to walk through how all of this work on our studies have went themselves to our positions and how those relate to the amendments. Yeah, so um, hopefully you all know that the League of Women Voters Minneapolis develops uh, public safety positions out of the study that that we undertook. And you, I'm going to summarize them now. You can find them on the uh, Reimagining Public Safety web pages in full. Um, but 
I'll just run through them based on based on some topics that we hit in general with with these positions. Um, so the league supports a public wellness approach to public safety. For example, we strongly support the use of police and non police responding to many calls received by 911. Um, co responders, as Jane mentioned, mental health and social workers. Um, can be involved in these many non-emergent traffic and property issues um, and domestic calls in particular, um, so to create a more flexible response uh, from the a Department of Public Safety. Um, and these mental health and social workers would be trained in crisis intervention and de-escalation de along with the officers uh, and would collaborate closely with the police to um, try to bring resolutions to the uh, difficult situations that don't end in, and the resolutions that would not end in violence. We also support cultural reform in the police department um, as key to changes that, that need to take place. Um, some of this has already been started as Jane has mentioned, um, but we need to expand and grow these kinds of changes. Um, we support training on bias and racism continuing and also the continued ban on warrior style training. Uh, we also support recruiting of women, people of color and varying cultural and economic backgrounds. And we, and in addition, we want better support of officers, physical and mental health themselves. It's a very difficult job being a police officer and they encounter incredibly stressful situations and they themselves need to be able to have support for what they are experiencing. Um, we also want more accountability with regard to um, police and their actions. We'd like to see much more transparency in police performance and, and uh, citizen complaint records. But we want, we encourage an external review of policies and procedures that guarantee citizen input. Uh, and as mentioned previously, we'd like to see changes in the police contract, um, including the end to state mandated arbitration for police discipline and um, a, an ability, um, most likely through the state legislature to bypass federal qualified immunity. Uh, another area that we'd like to, uh, that we, where we support public safety um, is in with regard to the mayor and and um, we support the mayor and department head deciding the structure duties and responsibilities of the police and as part of that the public safety lead would um, respond to the mayor and so we we have this we've had this position in our we have it in our public safety positions um, and we also support this kind of government structure um, by supporting the government structure amendment. Now, this is the public safety ballot language that you will see on the ballot in November. This is just a quick preview I'm going to do of it. You've probably seen this language in the paper. It's been hotly debated. It's been revised several times by the city council subject to mayoral veto. It's made two trips to the district court in Hennepin County and one to the Supreme Court. Uh, and this is how this is how it's landed. And this is how it, it will it will be printed on the ballots and what you will see. You can you can tell that the question is long, particularly with the explanatory note that follows it. Uh, and we're not going to read through it here. I'm going to summarize it, but hopefully you will study it and understand it well before you go to the ballot box. So this is our summary of the public safety amendment. And uh, you can look back at the language later and, and see, see how well I've done my job here. Um, but basically the amendment summarized, it replaces the police department with a department of public safety. That Department of Public Safety is to have a comprehensive public health approach to public safety. The department would be led by a commissioner of public safety. That commissioner would be nominated by the mayor and appointed by the city council. It would in, the, the department would include police officers as necessary. 
the minimum, minimum funding requirement for police that's currently in the charter and the minimum, minimum ratio of police to citizens that's currently in the charter would be eliminated. The specific functions of the department would be determined by ordinance and um, those ordinances would be put together by the city council and the mayor. The department would not be under the exclusive control of the mayor. It would be under shared control of the mayor and the city council via the executive committee, which has representation from both the mayor's office and the city council. So the last thing we want to focus on is how the public safety amendment aligns or doesn't align with league positions. As we've said, we are not taking a yes or no position on the amendment itself. Uh, frankly, that's because we it aligns with some of our positions and it does not align with others. Um, in, in, in alignment, there's one point to make here, but it's a big one. And that is that the public safety amendment supports a Department of Public Safety with a comprehensive public health approach. And the League of Women Voters in Minneapolis also support a public wellness approach to public safety. On to the misalignments. The first one with regard to um, the number of police officers, um, there, we have, there's some ambiguity here. It because um, the the language is that the department would include licensed police officers, peace officers, police officers, if necessary, uh, and we don't know. You know that that could mean that would be up to the city council to determine, and the mayor and the, within the executive council. What what does that mean? Does that mean? 50 officers? Does that mean something more akin to what we have right now, which is, I believe, is over 700? This is uh, the League of Women Voters Minneapolis position is that we need police in numbers sufficient to serve community need. In addition, the, we see some misalignment in the public safety amendment um, and league positions with regard to the uh, power and the um, administration of the police department. The public safety amendment indicates that the department will not be subject to the exclusive mayoral power over its establishment, maintenance, and command. The league position is that the mayor and head of public safety will determine the structure, duties, and responsibilities um, and other ma operating matters of the department. The league supports the mayor um, there be the leader reporting to the mayor and um, and that's we made that really clear in our public safety position so this this is um this is obviously some misalignment here the league also as i mentioned has long supported a change to city government structure and they support the the government structure amendment uh, that structure would be more like the federal government in that the mayor would act in an executive and administrative capacity with the city council acting in a legislative capacity with ability to audit administrative activities and the implementation of the laws by the executive. The league feels like this creates and is a tighter structure, which is much needed for the city to function more effectively and more efficiently. That's really, I, that is just about the end of it. Thanks, Jane. And um, we think that the, the government structure amendment um, is also somewhat misaligned in that it, it, there's, there are a lot of uncertainties in the public safety amendment. Um, and we also, one uncertainty is, is timing, relates to timing of, of the implementation of the amendment if it passed. Um, there's a 30 day window for that implementation uh, and it, it's, it's unclear what, what would happen in that 30 days. Um, so what would the Department of Public Safety look like after that 30 days? It's just, a, it's an ambiguity, it's just an unknown. So thank you. Uh, we've made it through our study and you can, you can see the website.
there. And, uh, but you can, of course, if you go to the League of Women Voters Minneapolis website, you will find it. Uh, I think it's under voter education uh, and, and, and other places on the website too. So. Thank you so much, Jane and Jennifer. We really appreciate it. And we do have uh, some questions. Great. Uh, and I, right. I think you need to wrest control away from me because I cannot, I lost my Zoom controls. Okay, I'm going to do that. All right. Thank, Thank you. you Jane. <laughs> All right. So our first question um, from Gordon Everest is what happens if both question one and question two pass? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> and one that we have um, thought about extensively and discussed extensively. And unfortunately, the, the answer to it is, is we, don't, we don't really know. We, what we do know is that the Charter, the head of the Charter Commission has indicated that he, he does not see a conflict between the two amendments and that they could therefore both be instituted. But we don't know exactly what that means. It, does that mean that it's a Department of Public Safety under control of the mayor or does that, does that mean something else? Um, and it, it, the one thing that we, we probably will see regardless of, um, if, if they both pass and are both implemented, uh, and we, we would likely see litigation uh, on, from one side or the other. And um, so it's very possible that if that situation did occur, that the way that the charter would uh, um, be resolved, the charter language would be resolved, may be decided by the courts. Jane, do you have anything to add to that? Well, the only thing I would add on the litigation part is, um, uh, and plus I'll do a little plug for the fact that the league has got questionnaires from all of the candidates, mayoral, city council, park board, and um, board of taxation and estimation on our website. So you can read um, the, their positions on everything. But I think one of the candidates actually said, I will sue, I will file a lawsuit. So I think Jennifer's you know, guess that there will be legal actions. One of the candidates already said he would do that. So, but yeah, I think that um, the fact that there is, it is likely to end up in this, in the, um, in the courts is a possibility, is a strong possibility. And yet people think that you could enter, you know, find the clauses and actually make them fit together. One of those things we don't know. Right. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, next question comes from Rebecca Hamblin. Why has COVID interrupted the Hennepin County um, Minneapolis Police Department partnership? Oh, that's a great question. Um, because when, when COVID first came, um, the um, mental health responders were not going out into the community and going to people's houses. So there was, you know, as, as we were locking down and not doing visits, so they were not going out. And some of the protocols, they were just starting to establish protocols. And so it didn't have protocols for any of those things. And so they just kind of pulled back as they were starting to um, go forward and do that. And, and um, so, yeah, hopefully that Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is also from Rebecca. Has the league considered taking a position on changing state law that prohibits municipalities from having a residency requirement for its employees? We do support recruitment of Minneapolis residents, and that is in one of our positions that came out of the study. Um, we have, we, you know, how that support would come to bear, we, you know, we haven't, it, that just, that piece just hasn't come to fruition for the league. I mean, it, it's potential, it's poten potentially could be through the state legislature, it potentially could be um, through city ordinance or some other, some other means, but um, encouraging police officers to be city residents is certainly a position that we have. Yeah, and I think I'm reading the question. I think what Rebecca is saying is that there is a state law that prohibits municipalities from having residency requirements. 
um, that the league might need to um, take a position on supporting a change to that. So, because I I don't think that this because in in the in the case of the Minneapolis police, what they're looking at is not making it be a requirement, is providing sort of some incentives and making it be, um, you know, more desirable. So, that's I don't know anything more about that, Jennifer or Ellen. And I will say, Ellen was also on the our committee, so you can feel free to jump in too, Ellen. You cannot <laughs> just moderate this. Great, thanks. Yeah, I think that. Uh... Well, our positions are are new, and you know how the league begins to advocate on them. You know, we'll see down the road. But um, but thank you for that question, Rebecca. I I don't think we haven't gotten to that stage yet of considering it. Okay. Um, the next question uh, is an anonymous one. Who would the commissioner of public safety report to? Well, I, 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 so I, so that's if the amendment passes, um, the, it's not clear if the report would be to the mayor or to the city council, um, or it probably would be a shared report. Uh, and that, so the, the charter amendment envisions that the executive council is still in place and that executive council has representatives from the mayor's office and also from the city council. So the report would be there. Yeah, and I think that just to clarify, that's kind of the, the conflict or the conundrum between the question one and question two. And I really encourage um, everyone to also tune in next week for the ballot question number one, because that is precisely the place where the two interplay because ballot question one says that the departments would be operationally reporting to the mayor. And in this ballot question two, the department operationally reports to the executive committee. So those are, that's the area of conflict between the two. So hopefully that answers the question. Good, thank you. We've noticed we also have some questions in the chat but we'll cover the ones in the Q&A first. So if you're waiting in the chat, we will get to those, but um, we're asking you if you can to put your questions into the Q&A. Um, the next uh, question is from uh, Rebecca Hamlin. Could you say a little bit more about the 30 days? Well, I'll start and then Jennifer, you can- Yeah, go ahead. So, so basically there's a requirement that the elections on November 2nd, that the changes that are voted on go into effect December 2nd. So if, if question two goes into effect, um, the Department of Public Safety and the police no longer, the police department no longer being a charter department would be required to go into effect on December 2nd. And so there's been questions raised about what does that look like if we're voting on something that's going to go into place on December 2nd? Um, what is it going to look like on December 2nd? What is the framework? What's the structure? What happens to the police? What happens to the chief of police who no longer is written into the charter? Um, so that's that's what the 30 day period is and why people are as we get closer to the election, people are asking questions about okay, if this is voted in, what's it going to look like on December 2nd? Great, thank you. Okay, um, the next question is from Polly Keppel. Is there any necessary Minneapolis Police Department reform that could, be, that could only be enacted by the establishment of a Department of Public Safety? Um, I think I understand Polly's question, and uh, I, as as far as I know, no. I mean, the the police department and the, the current structure that it's in, um, they can enact the same kinds of reforms that a Department of Public Safety could. Uh, a Department of Public Safety would um, perhaps have more or more pieces of the. Uh, 
entity, more of the entities who have impacts on public safety under that umbrella. Uh, but there's been a lot of good, great collaboration between the police department and, and other entities that have those impacts as well. So it, it's, it, you know, I don't, it's hard to, it's a little bit hard to answer that question in a vacuum because we, you know, without knowing what the, what the change would be, but it, you know, it doesn't seem from anything that we've looked at that there, that these kinds of, any sort of changes or reforms would re be required to be done by a Department of Public Safety. Yeah, thank you. Okay, a question here from uh, Gordon Everest. If shared, what happens if there's an emergency? We need to have a clear chain of command. Um, I would say that's kind of one of the concerns and frankly, one of the real drivers behind the city question number one. Um, and if you tune in next week, you'll hear some of the issues ar around the drivers, the interviews with all of the city department heads, some of the confusion that happened um, even during some of the unrest last year where um, city council people were giving independent direction to officers. So there was a lot of direction coming from different places. And this is that, this is a city, this is a, a city question one um, question that you just asked. So um, I, I think that I would, I would encourage you to tune in next week because there's there's been a lot of research done and on just some of the, it's that sort of classic 14 boss problem that the city has been experiencing, which causes some of the confusion and how particularly in a case of emergencies where you, you need some clarity. So. Great, thank you. The next question is from Nancy Johnston. What changes might the state legislature make to change the police contract and accountability issues? Well, there already have been some changes that the state legislature has made to create more accountability and to create um, more transparency in, in data um, with regard to um, police complaints and um, any police actions. So, I mean, that's the kind of work that the state legislature can do. Um, we, we had hoped that, that those were changes that they made in, in 2020. Um, we had hoped that we would see changes to the arbitration requirements as well at the time, and um, we didn't see those. So that is, you know, that's another area that where the legislature could, could step in. Um, the police, as I mentioned before, the police federation has a very strong lobbying presence at the state legislature. Um, and so that's, that's just part of the dynamic that's at play at the state legislative, legislative level. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from uh, Tess D but the Minneapolis Police Department already reports directly to the mayor, doesn't it? If these problems were already happening under the current system, would the Department of Public Safety Amendment really affect that, or is it more of a ballot question one problem? Do you want me to start on that, Jane? Yeah, start, because I'm still digesting it, so keep okay. going. I'm, to dig I'm still digesting the question. Um, so I, I, I feel like part of the question is if, if the mayor has already, has already had control over the police department, you know, have, have these, why haven't these reforms taken place? And, um, I think that 
you know, that's, there's no easy answer to that question. That's for sure. Um, and I, I really welcome you to, to dive into the, the web pages and some of the materials that are there. And we have a very comprehensive list of resources there. Um, it's, a, it's a very complicated picture. Efforts certainly have been made as, as Jane mentioned, um, and may, were made prior to the murder of George Floyd and since then. Um, whether I, the, whether that's a government structure question, I mean, that the two are intertwined in that the government structure amendment maintains the police department control with under the mayor. And, um, so whether that's an issue or not. I, I, I guess I'm not fully understanding the second part of the question, but yes, that that that's the what the um, government structure amendment does. Yeah, and and I've heard people, you know, sort of going to the first part of the question because I'm not sure I understand the second part either. But say, hey, the police department already reports to the mayor, and he hasn't fixed it. So why are we? Um, and and as we've looked at this and kind of gone deeply into it what i've come to understand is that we have a really really big deep problem um and you know the the police are certainly involved it's a it's a deep police problem it's a deep societal problem um and um and it's going to take a really strong commitment um, as I as I said earlier, it's a 150 year old problem, and it's going to take years, if not decades, to fix it. And we need to be working really. We need to work together. The the fact that the the city and the world has been shaken by what happened in Minneapolis is, you know, it's a horrible thing. But hopefully, we we're going to get some momentum to make changes that have not changed, um, and. It's, um, I think, to say it hasn't changed because the police reported to the mayor is really, really putting the, the, the flashlight on the wrong part of the problem. I think it's a long term historical problem that's going to take a lot of commitment and looking at, you know, that whole little fan diagram that Jennifer put up of all the entities that impact it, including ourselves. Um, so hopefully that. Yeah. And I, I will play devil's advocate to that um, just briefly, um, just by saying because I and I know that this this has this has come up and maybe this is embedded in the in the question. Um, if things have not changed yet, will don't we need some major shift, some major change um, to make change happen? And um, I think that that's 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 certainly part of the impetus for the public safety amendment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Tina Kaiser. If the ballot measure doesn't pass, what's the alternative process to change the charter to allow for implementing the reforms to the police department that we support? Can the city council recommend or approve changes to the charter directly? Yeah, I think there's three ways for things to get to for charter changes to get um, proposed from the Charter Commission, from the City Council, or from a citizen's petition, which is how the S4 um, petition uh, amendment came on there. So, um, yeah, there's there's opportunities as we are all, you know, learning what works and doesn't work from these amendments and what needs to happen. I think I think the citizens of Minneapolis have become much more aware of what is in our charter um, this past year. Um, and so there certainly is a way for some things, some of those things to be changed. Right. But I and I would add to that, though, that um, there are a lot of these reforms and changes don't need to start or end with the charter. There are so many of these changes that can be done in other areas, um, th with, whether it's in you know city government, state government, county government. Um, the charter doesn't need to be the place of reform. 
I mean, it can embody that. Um, and as we have, as we're seeing right now, their amendments can do that, um, but it's, it's not a necessity. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, from an anonymous attendee. In a public safety model, who decides who responds to a call? Well, I can start and then Jennifer can, can you know, there's um, pilots going on right now. And again, I'm going to um, pitch that January 5th um, civic buzz because I thought it was just, I just learned a lot from it. Um, there's pilots going on right now and the data associated with, I mean, it's the um, uh, Office of Performance and Innovation is working with the various departments within the city and they are literally going out and trying to understand how are citizens impacted by, you know, does it make you feel comfortable if people have a gun, if they don't, if they're wearing street clothes or if they're wearing uniforms and, and understanding that they're embedding um, social uh, social services people in the 911 place with the 911 operators looking if they can train them. The city is learning and they're putting pilots in place and and figuring it out and trying to learn. But as I said earlier, they're, they're professionals that are doing this, that are people that are really highly qualified, that really wanna help the social services people feel like they can really make a difference and they wanna step in and do things. So the, the work that they're doing is really amazing. Yeah, so it could be that that would be the kind of work that would be picked up and continued with a public safety department. Thank you. So the next question is from Jean Bacone. If question two passes, what then is the status of the city's contract with the police federation? So the contract has, um, it, it, would, it would continue. Um, it would depend who, who it would control. Um, it would be licensed police officers and those who belong to the union. There is a, um, a, a case in Minnesota that says that you cannot get rid of a union by getting rid of a department. Um, so getting rid of the police department does not get rid of the union and it does not get rid of the police contract. Um, now the police contract, uh, the current one expired in 2019 and it's been in negotiation uh, since then. By the terms of the contract, uh, the 2019 contract continues to control until a new contract is in, is in place. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Diane Grev. When the charter says we need 1.7 police for every thousand citizens, how can the council cut money from the police and move it to Southwesters or SWERS? Other places. <laughs> That's the submitted yeah. 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 I don't think that they in 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 moving the, the, the funding social the, workers social workers okay uh, yeah in, in moving six million dollars from the the budget i don't think that they were cutting the the number of police below the limit because i think that the limit was like 733 based on our um i think they're still funded to 733 now the, 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 they've had attrition so i think right now it's below 700. But I, I don't know. I mean, Ellen and they, they did not um, cut below the the prescribed funding, you know, limit. I don't believe they. If I if I don't recall exactly either, but I don't. I think that there there may have been some questions about whether that funding was was so severe that it would it would cut into that requirement, and some of the funding was restored, I believe. Um, but that, that's, a, it's a great question. And one that, that, that went into, I think was part of the litigation that was raised by, um, the Samuels and other Northside residents that, that 
who sued the city for not providing enough um, public safety responses um, to keep the, the city and its citizens safe. Um, we don't, I mean, we don't have a, a, an exact answer to that. I mean, I guess that would be a good question to ask your city council member. Great, thank you. The next question is from Meg Walters. And she says, the question around if the mayor already has control, why hasn't he fixed it? I think this goes back to the point that some of the core problems with the police, police abuse, discipline, et cetera, et cetera are with the union contract and arbitration. Isn't arbitration decided by the state legislature and not the mayor? And isn't it true that the contract between the city and the Minneapolis Police Federation is decided by the mayor and the 13 city council members? It is true that the contract um, has to be approved by the city council and by, by the mayor. Uh, and then on the other side is the, is the police federation. Um, the, the, the arbitration and whether arbitration um, stays in the contract is like all of this, of course, a complicated question. Uh, and it, it implicates the state legislature because um, arbitration of discipline is not low is not located exclusively in the police department in the police union it it relates to um, all other unions as well so i mean it's potentially the state legislator legislature could do a carve out for um the police union i mean that's one possibility that that has has been discussed um but to some extent the mayor's hands are tied uh, and the city council's hands are tied when it comes to arbitration and trying to get it out of the contract because it is uh, mandated by state legislation. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, this question is uh, also from an anonymous attendee. The point you mentioned about the police union remaining in place regardless of the amendment passing, doesn't that leave the possibility that the most powerful player in the dynamic with the power to decide what will be acceptable or not? Well, I think that's absolutely true. And that's kind of one of the points that we were making is that um, you really need to look at this thing holistically and that you know a lot of people will say, you know, point the fingers at the police, but it's it's not that simple. It's a more complex problem, and and you can let's say um, question two passes, and it becomes law enforcement underneath the Department of Public Safety. The contract follows, and we still have the contract. We still need to create law enforcement. Um, in the spirit that we we would like to create law enforcement, and um, so yeah, it is the, the problems don't go away. <laughs> you, you you really need to look at that at the whole, at the big picture, and and address all of those things. And you know, behavior, culture, the responders, the training, you know, all of the things that that you know as we looked at it it became a really multifaceted problem that requires a multifaceted um, solution. And I'm going to say, I think we're get reading, reaching the end. We're probably past the end. So I'm going to say one other thing here, um, which is kind of a promotion for the government structure amendment next week. Um, I think that because this is a problem that's going to take decades to solve, we need really, really high qualified professional people that are going to stay here and be committed and work on it. And, and so we need a government structure that functions well, you know, you don't. And so I think that, you know, the league's position on question one is, um, 
is is so important because it it creates that that account, that clear accountability and responsibility in an organization where people will want to stay. When you look at the turnover of people within city government, um, and we've seen as we've looked at and interviewed and talked to some of the public safety people, there are some terrific people doing terrific work, and we need those people on the ground to solve this problem. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, this question comes from Christine. Does the number of police funded by the city charter include everyone in the department, that is desk staff, undercover detectives, administrators, as well as <coughs> patrol officers? Are there currently any social services staff in the department? So I think that the, the ratio that's required by the charter is just for police officers. It's not for other, other staff. Um, the, the second part of that question, Jane, maybe you know better than, than I do. I mean, there was um, this co-responder program that was being run by um, folks from Hennepin County and it was run in conjunction with the police. Um, and, but then there, there are also programs that are being run by the Office of Violence Prevention. And so um, I, I don't know if there are any social workers in the police department right now. I can't, I can't answer that question. Yeah, I can't answer the question either. It's a good one, good question. All right, so um, we are out of the open questions um, and peeked into the chat and uh, let me see if we see anything else there. I don't think so. This one. I think it's more of a comment. I just I just saw a comment pop up from Ming, who is also on the public safety committee. And I just want to give a quick kudos to her because she did such amazing work on our web pages and um, we couldn't have put it together without her. Great, yeah, and I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank Jane Lansing and Jennifer Wilson again for this fantastic presentation. Um, as they have encouraged all of you to come back next week, Thursday night, the 30th at seven for a, a presentation on ballot question one, the government structure Executive Mayor, Legislative Council. And thank you all for joining us. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.